Welcome to The Month End, a CPG community chat. The Month End will provide emerging CPG brands real-life knowledge into the accounting, finance, and operational world. Our guests will be key stakeholders from those same brands as well as other key contributors to the industry, which all have vast experiences and insights that we'll share with the audience. Welcome to Episode 7 of the Month End Podcast. Today we have George Milton from Yellowbird Sauce down in Austin, Texas. Really excited to have you today, George. How are you doing? Man, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Brad. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, George and Yellowbird have been a client of Account Fleet since 2018, um, and, and, and we're very uh, uh, glad to have you, and you've been an awesome client uh, today, and your branding is unbelievable. Um, this isn't a marketing podcast, so I'm not going to get into that, but it catches my accountant eye, to say the least. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, um, great. Well, what was interesting is knowing you as a um, knowing you personally, I was kind of interested to see what your title is on LinkedIn. And it does say CEO. I was expecting some sort of creative, you know, title that comes into play, but clearly you are the CEO. So kind of tell us um, a little bit of background of what you do at Yellowbird. How long have you been in business? You know, when did you kind of start to do it? You know, nothing too long and intense. I'm sure you're doing this a lot, but I just want to kind of give the listeners a little bit of understanding of, um, you know, what you sell, where you do it, why why are you in this, the sauce game, and 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 where? How long have you been in in this venture? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll I'll give you as brief of a version as I can. But uh, myself and my partner Aaron um, started uh, Yellowbird in our kitchen uh, here in the house where I'm recording now in South Austin. Um, and we started in 2012 and it was really just a, uh, we had initially moved to Austin as creatives. So my background is in, uh, music, like live music, music production, um, things like that. And, uh, I was working as, as a full-time musician when we moved here. Um, Erin was working as a full-time freelance designer when we moved here and her background is in, uh, uh, graphic design and user experience, web design, things like that. Um, and she did that at the corporate level for a number of years. Um, we started making like hot sauce in our in our kitchen, as I'm sure like a lot of people do, right? This is a this is a hobby that a lot of people have. It like hot sauce enthusiasts are. Um, it, it it's a really like enthusiastic group uh, of people and. Um, we we had started making stuff because we were using a lot of um a lot of uh like hui fong sriracha and we were we were also like trying to eat better so like less we're trying we're trying to find something that was like less sodium and not so much sugar and like preservatives and things like that and in 2012 we really couldn't find anything so so um I have a little bit of a background as a musician of course i've spent a lot of time also working in restaurants um (laughs) And so I have, I, I started working in restaurants when I was like 15. My first restaurant was a hot wing restaurant. So like me and hot sauce go back a bunch of years. And I was like, I bet we, I bet I could figure something out. Like I can't find it. So I'm just going to make it. And then in, in 2012, we were just making it for ourselves at our house. And of course, like Aaron being a graphic designer, we, we said, Hey, this would be a cool project for us to do together just as a, just like as a, to take to a farmer's market or like, it'd be cool to like sell it to like one or two local, you know, restaurants here in Austin. Um, That's really how we started. So we had, obviously we've come a long way since then. So Yellowbird is, um, is one of the best selling uh, hot sauces in the natural grocery world in the United States at this point. Um, When, when that, uh, when the scan data comes out every, uh, every, every time the, the scan data drops, it's like, you know, Tabasco and Cholula and Yellowbird and a couple of others in that top five list. So like we, it, it was really by accident that we started this business. And I think that that's one of the reasons that's been really important for us to surround ourselves with people who are experts in, in certain, in certain fields to kind of tie it into, uh, you know, what Accountfully is doing is I, I did not, you know, I came in to, I came into it with a, with a, with a degree, you know, with a degree in like theater performance and jazz studies and stuff. So like, um, it, I, I had a, I had a bunch of years of learning, you know, on the job about business finance and, you know, business planning and, 
like the the management people management and finance management and all of the things that go along with i learned a lot of that stuff on the job so that's kind of the short history of of yellowbird from you know 2012 to today so we're um we're not quite eight years old i don't i don't really like put our i put our birthday at like january um january of 2013 well i guess that does make us eight years it old. Makes us yeah, exactly as the, account, as the accountant i would say that's eight yeah. years old yeah i do not know how to count so <laughs> glad to have you around brad well, that's a great background. That definitely is very uh, much the case of how a lot of CPG brands are um, started. It's accidentally in the kitchen or by a passion or, hey, I was looking for this type of food and didn't find it. Um, so fascinating background. So kind of a, a couple of things I want to focus on as we kind of move forward. Number one is kind of selling sales channels. Where did you decide? How did you decide to get in that? And then um, additionally, kind of on the inventory side, we'll start in the sales chat side. So right now, you know, you're selling on your website, which again is a fantastic website. I'm assuming you use Shopify, um, you know, via direct wholesale through the big distributors, things like that. Can you kind of give me a background of kind of when you guys started or what was your sales channel um, decision making? It may have been like just get in there and sell wherever we can get out the name brand, but kind of give us a little background of, uh, uh, along that path as well as then when um, what decisions or what like uh, KPIs or what did you review to make better decisions to move forward kind of in the specific sales channels um, um, across that exist? Excuse me. Well, you're good. Yeah, I mean, you're giving 2013, George, a lot of credit here, but I'll tell you kind of how we started it was that, like the first thing that we did was we went to like farmers markets just here in Austin and a lot of, you know, a lot of cities have a farmers market and there are some like, that was kind of like, a good place to start because we had to you have to get certain permits and you know things to like I, there's a lot of they've, they've changed cottage food law since 2012 so there's a lot more stuff that you can get a permit to make in your house but at the time you couldn't make you know so i say we started in our kitchen but then we went to a farmer's market they were like well we need a health inspection from a you know certified kitchen and stuff like that so we kind of started the process of figuring out how to Per, properly permit, you know, everything and get everything kind of like stamped uh, by the, you know, authorities that needed to, you know, be involved. Um, but we initially started selling in, uh, in farmer's markets and we started selling to, it was kind of my dream to be like a local Austin brand. And so I kind of wanted to sell to some of the local restaurants. So I took, honestly, like it took me about six to eight months of just going like door to door at food service establishments. And I know in the land of, in the time of COVID, it's not, it's not the same like sales opportunity that you have there, but the, I was kind of basically like a door to door hot sauce salesman. And I was like going door to door at places in, you know, places in Austin being like, Hey, you know, we make this stuff here in Austin, you know, we use local produce. Um, you guys are carrying Tabasco. Wouldn't you rather like carry this local thing? And so like, that's how we sold. And it was very, it was not scalable the way that we were doing it at first. It was me in a, you know, like I was used to working music hours. So like I had, I found a commissary kitchen that agreed to let me come use the, like I could use the off hours for like a discounted rate. So like they would give me like 10 PM to 6 AM. And I like nobody else wanted to go then, so I could get like half half of what the hourly rate was for the commissary kitchen. Um, that commissary kitchen doesn't exist anymore, so don't ask me for the contact info. But um, but but so that's that's kind of how we started, and our we did put it on uh, we did put it up on a website. So we had a uh, Aaron built an early website. The, we first started out on um, WooCommerce, yep. uh, which is a WordPress on the WordPress platform, but that's really more for uh, blogging and things like that. Um, so we're, we're on Shopify now, but we are, we did have some early success um, having it on the website. We got some good, we got some good write-ups in the early days. Um, like Thrillist wrote about us a couple of times when it, when it was literally just me making like 40 bottles at, at a time um, in a little commissary kitchen. We got like a write-up from Thrillist in like early 2014. And they were like, oh, this is the next big thing. And we got all sorts of orders on our website that we couldn't fill. Um, but that, that's really how we started. We, I would say our, our first kind of big break came when we're here in Austin, which is where the global headquarters for Whole Foods is. 
Mm. Our first, our first break, like the starting of our business came kind of accidentally. We got, as I said, I was selling to a bunch of places here locally in Austin, like just local restaurants in Austin. And we got, um, in 2013, we got a call from the local Whole Foods office and they were like, Hey, cause I used to put my cell phone number just on the bottle. Right. It was like such a small operation. I was like, questions, give me a call, you know? <laughs> and it wasn't like a cheesy marketing thing. It was just literally just like, Hey, here's my cell phone number. We don't do that anymore. But in, <laughs> in, in the, in those early days, it was like, we were selling to these local, these cool local like cafes and stuff. And I mean like a handful, like four, I had four customers plus farmers markets and that was it. Um, I got a call from whole foods and they were like, Hey, is this, uh, yellow bird and I was like yeah um, and they were like hey we have the this stuff we see this stuff everywhere and apparently they went to lunch they rotated through those four places that I like the the Whole Foods like procurement team was just rotating through those four places that I sold yellow bird to without I didn't know that they were like you we see you everywhere and it was like well I'm at the four places you go and they're like yeah we got to get it at Whole Foods so we start we got 40 Whole Foods stores um, the next year, it took me about a year before I could figure out how to make enough hot sauce and deliver it to, because when I started, I was just, deli- I was just like delivering it in my, you know, 2008 Nissan Xterra to every, so like when they were like, hey, we've got Whole Foods in Dallas and Oklahoma City and Louisiana that we want to carry this stuff in. I was like, how do I get it there? So I had to learn about the world of distribution. I didn't know about that. Interesting. That is fascinating. And uh uh, it's just, just makes me laugh and knowing you of, of how that all went down. Um, in terms of then, I guess, moving forward, when you, when you did that, then how did you execute on two things, right? Creating the product to, 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 you know, fulfill the orders from Whole Foods, as well as your other side orders to restaurants, food service, you know, farmer's market, as well as then how did you, you know, what was your solution for distribution? Did you literally drive around or did you, you know, like get through those? Cause I think that that's a great learning point for people once they hit that tipping point of like, oh no, now I need to figure out how to, how to, how to, how to uh, solve the, the supply chain procurement function plus the fulfillment function. Clearly today, today's day and age is a lot different again with, with e-com and Shopify and 3PLs connected to Shopify and, and all this, you know, situation, but again, in Amazon, but you know, back then it, it's interesting to learn about. Yeah. So um, there, there's kind of a, you talk about like a tipping point, there's, there's kind of a balance that, you're always out of balance, I think, with like, um, with these things. So like, when we first needed distributors, we were still too small for most distributors. So I, so like, um, I'm trying to think about what the best way to say this is. It it is essentially like, when we, when we went into that world, we said, okay, we have 40 Whole Foods that we have to supply. Now, 40 stores, like 40 locations is not a lot you know, like a, like a major distributor, that's not a big deal to a major distributor. And it's not a big deal for like, uh, most like co-manufacturers someplace where you, you know, and, and I'm assuming that, you know, and maybe some of your listeners know what I mean by co-manufacturers, like where I would like farm out the manufacturing of my product. Um, so like for the big players, like 40 stores is just not much you know, but you gotta, you gotta service those 40 stores so that you can get to the next level, you know? So like, if I'm saying, okay, I need 500 stores before a a major distributor or co-packer or whatever will look at me, how do I get there without having a major distributor or co-packer? That's a big problem for most, you know, CPG, I would say not just CPG food brands, but any sort of brand where you have to make and deliver a product. Mm -hmm. For us in the early days, we did have the option to, because our stuff is shelf stable, that's a big deal. And we did have the option to deliver like direct to store. So I could either drive my car to a store and deliver it, or I can mail it to the store, FedEx or USPS or something. Of course, like our, you know, being a lower price point product, like I'm going to eat all the shipping and then some. So like if I had to mail something to a store, I would lose money on it. So we actually found, like I just started asking around and we found a uh, a small distributor. Again, these guys are not in business anymore. So don't ask me who they were. We found a small distributor. It was literally like, it was literally like a, a, a group of guys. It was five guys. They had five 
white vans, just white unmarked vans. And they would deliver, their model was that they would deliver for companies that were like our size or like, you know, in that range of like really small companies that can't, you know, they were like, hey, let's get the business of these companies that, that can't get the eye of like the big distributors yet. And I mean, these guys, I, they worked their asses off, but like they would, they missed so many deliveries because they were like, it was just like this, it was just like these, they were just like cowboys, basically. They were like, they were like, oh, we got, you know, we got a van full of products in, you know, Oklahoma City and all of these have to get to Houston by 2 p.m. this afternoon and it's 1030 right now and you're like, we'll go, I don't know, get on the road. <laughs> and it was just like, it was like that. And then Whole Foods would be like, hey, why isn't, you know, we try to schedule some like you know, like, and me and Aaron were trying to like schedule like in-store demos and stuff. So we would show up and, you know, in Houston and, uh, and be like, oh, we're here to do our demo. And they'll be, they would be like, well, your product hasn't showed up, shown up yet. And we'd be like, what the hell? And, you know, and then 20 minutes later, a white van would come blazing in the back, you know, in the back loading dock or whatever. So it was just like, it was like the wild, like the beginning stages of this were like the wild west. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any Mm -hmm. you know we were just we were just taking what we could get so that's, that's hilarious and that's awesome um in terms of then um you know like i guess now that we're talking about kind of distribution you know wild wild was the name of the company wild wild west <laughs> distributors no no should have been <laughs> so um moving along now where you're you, you know you, you that was the initial 40 stores and whole foods distribution etc so when did you what was your next break or when did you move into the unified KHEs or the regional distribution and kind of what made you decide to move in that direction? Was it pure just growth and volume? Well, it's kind of, I mean, you kind of are forced in that direction unless you have like a really solid alternative model, you know, like if I had, if I had from day one said like, Hey, we're going to deliver direct to store. That's always going to be the model. I didn't build that out from day one. And honestly, like I did, like it would be really difficult our products are fairly heavy and fairly like, you know, fairly like cheap per pound considering like how, how heavy they are to like ship. And we get, you know, like the slight subject change, but we get a lot of, you know, uh, questions or complaints or whatever about like, Hey, why is it so expensive to ship, you know, your hot sauce? you know, up, up here to Minnesota or whatever. And I'm like, I don't make those rates. That's USPS decides that FedEx, UPS make those decisions. I like ask them why it's so expensive, but it is. So like, that was kind of, you know, the Unify Kehi route is kind of the route that you have to go. And I do think that there are, you know, uh, there are companies who are doing all, who are taking alternative routes. I do think there need to be alternative routes because, you know, Unify and Kehi have a bit of a stranglehold on that aspect of the, of the business. And they do take advantage of that from a financial um, standpoint, um, which is unfortunate. It is what it is though. But like we, we got to the point where like we were doing, we started doing, we started doing well in our region of Whole Foods. And then our first really expansion was just in Whole Foods saying like, hey, we're doing well in the Southwest region of Whole Foods. You know, maybe let's try it in, in the Rocky Mountain region of Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we said that, like, you know, or let's try it in, mid in Midwest and Whole Foods was kind of on board to do a little bit of expansion with our brand. They weren't, they weren't ready to say like, hey, it's a national Whole Foods brand. It took us, you know, uh, six years to convince them to that it was a you know it was a national brand but you know like as we started expanding like these guys with vans you know were having trouble just delivering in texas so we we really leaned on whole foods to like hey like unify is that's your distributor you know that's a big part of their business i know that we're not big enough for them yet but if we're gonna have you know 120 whole food stores can you, can you like put in a word for us essentially? And so Whole Foods kind of pushed that button for us, you know, like we, we didn't really have any other leverage with UNFI at that point. So we said like, Hey, can we, there's no way that we can do this. 
without Unify. Like I can't deliver these to, you know, I can't pay for UPS to take, you know, three cases of hot sauce to Denver, Colorado. Like it's just, there's no way for me to make any money on that. Mm -hmm. And I have to make money because otherwise we go out of business. Yep. And you know that as an accountant, that's yep. rule number one. Exactly. In accounting, so. So what are the uh, first three words that come to your mind when you talk about deductions? When I talk about deductions? When you think about the word deductions via the distributors, you know, what are the th first three words that come to your mind? Oh, the first three words are uh, expletives. And I don't know what your, <laughs> I don't know what the rating is on your podcast. <laughs> Uh, so how do you, you know, to kind of back clearly, like, um, for those on, you know, listening through the distributors, especially unified KE, they basically, you agree to deductions and then, you know, you sell $50,000 a product, you get paid $20,000, right. Or whatever. It depends. It's a yeah. lot more upfront, but how do you guys manage deductions up, you know, approved deductions review? Like, what is that process for you now in terms of clearly now you're more sophisticated, have been in the game for a long time. So you understand it more, but you know, in terms of what, what are you doing now with that? Well, I will tell you a secret that nobody I've talked to, no matter how sophisticated they are, has this figured out. Um, and like Unify does it, Kehi does it, Amazon does it. Um, we we work with Walmart as well, and Walmart actually doesn't doesn't pepper pepper us with deductions the way these other guys do because Walmart like Walmart makes their money selling products, which is which is what you would think everybody would how everybody you think that unify makes their money selling products a lot of their money is made on dollars that they get from their suppliers you know what i mean so like that's a big part of their bottom line is like what are their account managers getting from suppliers like how like what programs can they sign them up for what kind of like deductions can they take um so like deduction management is like for us we do the best we can. We don't have anybody dedicated in-house to deductions management, but our, uh, you know, like our accounting team, our sales team, everybody kind of like pitches in on deductions management and deductions disputes. And the hard part about it is that like, the hard part about it is that you're never in the, the way that they do deductions, you're never really in the driver's seat with it because the way they do deductions is they just, they take it out of your check. So like you're saying, you sell them $50,000 worth of stuff and you send them an invoice for $50,000 and you're expecting $50,000 to come back. And now there's some things that we know, well, like if we have set up a promo or something, mm -hmm. a discount in a certain retailer, let's say that we're doing a promo at Whole Foods, you know, we'll get a report of like, here's the products that got that scanned through the register, you know, here's the discount and we'll get a, a good list of that from Whole Foods we'll get that from UNFI, we'll be able to match those up and say like, hey, this was that promo there. But then there'll be other there'll be other things where we've had to like beef up our systems just to mitigate some of these kinds of losses where like UNFI and Kehi and, you know, Amazon as well, like we'll, we'll, you know, they'll order, let's say a hundred cases of hot sauce and we will put together a hundred cases of, you know, exactly what they ordered. We'll put it on a pallet you know, their driver will sign for it at the door, you know, at the lift gate, and it'll go out a hundred cases of sauce. And then we'll get a check and there'll be a deduction report that says you only shipped us 82 cases of sauce. And we're like, what? No, we shipped a hundred and they're like, prove it. We like, yeah. they write us a check for 82 cases. So there's 18 cases. And I mean, this is at a small scale, but this, ha this is happens literally like every order we ship, you know, a hundred cases, a thousand cases. Oh, we only got 785. Yeah. And and we're like, no, you got, we shipped a thousand. Your guy signed for a thousand yeah. and they're like, prove it, prove it. Yeah. And so like, we've had to develop systems where like everything gets signed off. Everything gets a video, a picture. So like, if there's a, if, they, if they're like, Hey, you only shipped to 750 and we're like, Hey, here's a picture of your driver receiving the pallet. And here's, you can count the layers, you can count the tiers, like we send multiple pictures, we send the BOLs, the packing slips, like we just have, we have had to build this massive amount of like documentation around everything where it used to be like, hey, here's a packing slip, here's an invoice, you know, the driver signed for 100 cases, and we send an invoice for 100 cases, the order is for 100 cases, if all three of those things match up, then you pay us for 100 cases. And now that's, 
you know, it's, I, I would say that, you know, it's made us be more sophisticated. I think that they're also getting a little more uh, sophisticated of, of, about how they're getting these extra dollars. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think that that's true. I think from, you know, my perspective and the the clients that we serve and just knowing the industry and then that it's, um, you know, when you get into the distribution world, make sure you talk to some people with experience of best practices, you know, what contracts you're agreeing to make sure you leverage the brokers that are out there and, and understand of that stuff. Cause if you don't, you know, contractually, if you agree to, you know, one free fill of store and you get literally across 300 stores, like there's a lot of money that's literally just out there that you're not thinking it through. And after the fact, documentation, sign offs, pictures, that's what's going to cover your ass. Like literally the onus is on you to prove it to them because they're just going to take deductions as George, George says, and you need to prove that no, you actually executed what we have. And, and that's that. And, and that's the frustrating part about that world, but it is the world right now um, for, you know, for the, the natural food space and CBG brands is you work through these two big distributors and even other ones, and even Amazon too. It's, it is what it is. And you have to kind of learn that and, 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 build that in, price that in, in terms of the time spent, the review process, the pricing, et cetera. Um, last thing on the sales channels, do you have a favorite sales channel that you have, you know, Shopify, direct to consumer, you know, uh, through distribution? Do you like, do you think like the way you position your brand and one of them has been more successful or kind of just, you know, just kind of wondering that from, uh, you know, a, a standpoint of, of where you view the company? Yeah. So, I mean, I, our biggest sales channel is, is retail grocery stores. Um, but I really, I mean, I, you've mentioned Shopify several times. I think that like Shopify is, is a really great <laughs> Shopify is great. And not, you know, selling, selling online, like D to C like democ, like the more you can like democratize these sorts of things that I love that the fact that like anybody, not anybody can have a successful business, but anybody can start a business mm -hmm. the same way that it was like, you know, I mentioned all of these like hurdles of like going through distributors and like, I, like, I think of it as like gatekeeper. <laughs> I mean, there's gatekeepers to kind of every segment. So there's a lot of stores where Yellowbird still isn't sold. And I'm telling you like, Hey, we're the, you know, we're, we're one of the top, you know, national brands uh, in hot sauce, but there's still chains, natural grocery stores that you can go to in the U S that don't carry our stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, if they, you know, if you look at the data, if you look at sales data, they probably should. And that's what we tell them. We have meetings with them as respectfully as possible. Like you probably should, you know, it's like, if you are a grocery store and you have a hot sauce set and you don't carry Cholula, well, if I'm the Cholula sales rep, I can just say like, we're Cholula, you probably should. And they're right, right? Cholula is a competitor of ours, but like they're right. If they say, if they go to a buyer that's not carrying Cholula, it's like, you should carry Cholula. Your customers want to buy it. And that's, you know, the same thing with Yellowbird. It's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not pitching a small mom and pop brand anymore. You know, I'm right. pitch, pitching a leading national brand and I'm saying you should be carrying it. But these places have, you know, it's one person or two people or, you know, whoever that gatekeeps that uh, this is a long winded answer to your question, but the less gatekeepers you have, I think the better, like in my mind, we should let the customer decide what they want to buy and places like, I mean, I like selling on Amazon. It's very expensive to sell on Amazon. It is hard to turn a profit selling on Amazon. So I'll say that to anybody who's like, hey, hey, let's grow this, let's make a you know million dollar business on Amazon. It's if you sell a million dollars worth of worth of product on Amazon, if you can be $50 profitable, like hats off to you. But like it, it's hard to it, like it's hard to make uh, it's hard to make a profit on Amazon, but it is a great marketing channel. I would say that my favorite to take the long way around the barn is probably direct to consumer just because there's you, there's still, um, I mean, there's still money that you have to spend. You still have to like get people to figure it out. You still have to like advertise on Google or Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, wherever you're, you know, however you're going to get the word out about your product, you still have to pay money in advertising. But when I look at like, when I look at like what I'm spending on, like to get this, to get my product from me to you, I, I know like, I have absolute transparency to what that is. Like I know I can see if there's a 
you know, if there's a shipping claim, because I mean, every company has some breakage, has some spoilage, whatever it is, you know, like we have issues where like, if our stuff goes, oh, you know, oh, has to go over the mountains and seals pop or something in the, in the USPS truck, then we, you know, we end up replacing stuff for a customer or giving them a voucher to go to a store, whatever, like there's going to be costs, but I really like Shopify. I really like D to C kind of like, you know, just because it gives it gives br the brand more control over what mm -hmm. they over what they do. There's no gatekeeper that says you can or can't access these customers. You can or can't access this um, this group of consumers. And it also like the the last thing would be I think that we've all seen that like the last 12 months has accelerated you know e-commerce by probably 10 years. Just yeah, it's forced people to go shop online who maybe you know like our parents are shopping more online than they used to because Correct. they had to figure out how to do it and now that they figured out how to do it, i mean there was just like a learning curve or like once we force people over that curve there's so many more people shopping online now so yeah do no that. it's it's a completely different animal than it was if we chatted last February 2020 um, versus where it's at now, direct consumer. Um, I mean, I love it. I, I love seeing our clients do it. You know, clearly it's a it's a it's a marketing advertising play. Typically, brand following is really how successful you're going to be there. But um, um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting how each sales channel has their own specific metrics you need to review and different cost structures and different like go to market campaigns. But um, good on that. So the last kind of main topic I want to touch on is inventory. So you in-house manufacturer, um, you've been an in-house manufacturer since we've worked with you, but when you started getting into these Whole Foods and out of your commissary, your third shift <laughs> commissary kitchen, um, when did you like, did you start using commands at some point? Did you go right to manufacturing? Just kind of give a little story around that. And I'm going to talk about like how you, when you got to manufacturing, how did you finance the products? Like where did the money come from? So start kind of when you got into those Whole Foods and, and what your, um, you know, manufacturing uh, supply chain looked like. Sure. So when we first got in Whole Foods, um, I, I was, uh, I did find, I went through several co-manufacturers. I will say that like our first run of product for Whole Foods was through a co-manufacturer. And I found out after they manufactured, after they made the first batch, they added 20% water to the product. And so like it went from um, like it went from there and I, I didn't realize that until it was too late, right? Like it went from their dock to Whole Foods, uh, to Whole Foods stores and, uh, they were unpacking it, putting on the shelves and there was like, you know, like it was separating, there was just like water sitting on the top of the product and Whole Foods called us and was like, you have to take this back. And we did, we did, it was extremely costly. It almost put us out of business um that that and that co-packer that co-manufacturer got fired like we so we went through a couple of different co-manufacturers between 2014 and 2016 um we did find a co-manufacturer that was doing well for us for a little while and then they had some major turnover in staff and um then they started not doing as great uh so we did do that for a little while. We started, uh, we started moving into what is now our full-time manufacturing facility in late 2016. We had a, we had essentially a big falling out with our co-manufacturer at the time, and and uh, and we had this whole thing that was basically like, well, you guys aren't doing a good job. You're fired, and they were like, you can't fire us. We quit. It was that kind of. It was like that kind of thing where like, okay, we got to get all our stuff out. And we had some equipment over there and like a lot of inventory over there. And we've always, um, we've always managed all of our raw inventory, like from day one, that's been a thing that I've been, you know, that I've been on about is like, we want to manage, you know, I want to make sure that we're getting fresh produce yeah. and I want to make sure that it is certified organic, that it, that it meets all of these specifications that, that I'm not just selling customers marketing terms that we are actually fulfilling the promise that we, that we make to people. So like, there's always been an inventory issue. And I think, you know, like if, if you had started working with us in 2015 or 2016, 
it would have been like, okay, well, how do we, you know, like the problem then was how do we manage inventory that somebody else is warehousing, you know, like it's, it's somebody else's building. And this is, you know, people deal with this all the time with like three PLs and, you know, even co-manufacturers, you have finished goods. Um, but when we transitioned to having our own facility, it actually got easier in some ways. Um, so we started, we started in 20, uh, 20, early 2017 running in our new facility. Um, and so then we had complete like ownership of, you know, raw inventory, packaging inventory, you know, like labels, bottle caps, all of that stuff. And, you know, like, um, the, our produce, all of our produce we owned and we could go out and count, we could go out and physically count it. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the, the path trajectory we took. 2017 was really the first year that we had, that we had complete ownership of all of those things. And once we did have complete ownership of all those things, it, you know, like that's when we realized when we started with Accountfully, we were using, um, we're using QuickBooks online and we had, um, we had a couple of different programs we were using, I think like deer.com or we used your inventory. We started with, yeah. We when tried you started out, with us, you were trying to get your inventory kind of the accounting function related to it or in, in, in place to support that. And then I think, um, I don't know what a year later or whatever you went to NetSuite and that's still what you're on, right? Yeah. We switched to NetSuite and you know, I'll be a little bit of an ad for NetSuite. It's expensive, but like, um, it, like for us, it's helped us, especially like building inventory, like QuickBooks, QuickBooks does okay with managing inventory. But the problem that we were having when we started with you guys was that it was really like QuickBooks online was really set up and dear inventory was really set up more for like, okay, I have a hundred widgets and I bought them at this price and now I'm going to sell them at that price plus whatever it wasn't set up as much for like, okay, I've got all of these parts yeah. and then I'm going to take them and make them into all of these other finished goods. And then the finish, and then I have to take all of that stuff out of, out of raw inventory, out of packaging inventory. And then I have to mark it up into finished inventory and add all of this stuff to finished goods. So that's, that process was tough for us. Um, we do, I, I think uh, we getting into getting into a routine. I mean, NetSuite helped, right? Like we have some different like modules, but like it was more of just like getting into a routine of how do we do it? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I tell, um, and you know, we have a lot of clients, majority of our clients are selling QuickBooks Online, Use Deer or Fishbowl or SOS. You guys went to NetSuite. I think the, 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 the for the in-house manufacturers of the world, there's much more complexity and, and much more consistency that's needed. Whereas if you're buying a finished good and reselling it, there's less than you who maybe have a handful of SKUs, right? So from my perspective to, to, to folks like yourself is get a system that you can use and leverage, get a team that you can use to leverage and kind of move forward and execute and make sure that consistently you're updating and, and managing inventory. When you went to in-house and you started doing that, two final questions. The equipment you bought, did you lease it? Did you buy it? How did you make that happen? Um, and then the second question I'll get to once you answer that. Yeah, so the equipment we bought, um, we we tried to get it bank financed because equipment is one of those things where like, if a bank can just put a lien on it, it's it's a fairly, it's fair, it's a fairly stable asset for them. Mm -hmm. The same way that it's, you know, fairly straightforward to like, get a loan to buy a car or like, you know, getting a loan to buy a house or something, it's a fairly stable asset. So um, for the bank, I mean, you know, it's not, a, not necessarily an asset for the business if you're leasing it, but um, yeah, all, all of our stuff ended up being leases through private, um, essentially private uh, finance years. So, you know, we, we ended up going to you know, um, we have, we have, a we have a couple that we use exclusively now after like years of like, if I have, if I have new equipment needs, I have, you know, I have like one or two guys that I send these deals to. And essentially what they do is they, pr the, the lease comes from, still comes from a bank. Right. But they're like, you can think of it like when you move into your first apartment, you know, and you're, and you're like, 
and you're like, you got a job, right? You got a job like scrubbing toilets at the, you know, local gold's gym or whatever. Um, I'm just going back to my job history, but like the, like you have a job, you have stable income to pay for this thing, but they're not going to like, they're not going to trust like 18 year old George to like sign on the dotted line. So you get, you know, like a, a lot of people have their parents, even if their parents aren't paying for it, their parents are co-signing on that lease. They're saying right. like, they're saying like, Hey, all, yeah, if he can't pay it, I'll be responsible for it. And so we have, we use private companies uh, like that, who essentially say like to the bank, like, Hey, I know this is an expensive piece of equipment. Like clearly Yellowbird can pay the bills, but just in case we're going to, we're going to sign on the dotted line with them and essentially like take, you know, they're going to mark it up, you know, and take those extra percentage points uh, just for being, you know, just for being liable. Yep for that equipment. So that's how, that is how we finance uh, all of our equipment. And there's, we do essentially like a three year, like lease to own deals is how we've worked out all of them. So we own half of our equipment now and the rest of it is still in some stage of lease to own. It's awesome. Yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of folks don't again, understand that the whole point of the different, the creativity you can get around financing, right. Related to having a co-signer or a guarantor, basically that is a, a high net worth individual or a high net worth business or somebody in the community that can help you. And then you can go to the bank or lo local regional bank and, and make that happen. And so there's some creative solutions there versus going into a traditional big bank and say, give me money. They're like, again, George, you're just, you know, you're starting a hot uh, you know, a, a hot sauce here and you're still scrubbing toilets at Gold's Gym. Like, how can I have confidence you're going to pay this back? And, and so just understanding that, but also uh, for the folks here, like George and, you know, Yellowbird didn't do that to year four or year five, right? So it's not like you need, you know, it's always a walking start, jogging start, understanding how important your inventory is or, or that quality or that control. And then you can kind of make better decisions there. Last question. What personnel, um, team, et cetera, internal team, did you have to manage your inventory operations, et cetera? Like, what did your team look like when you started that? Oh, man. Um, our team, essentially, so we, we, one of our very first hires was uh, our operations director. And that, like, that's been, like, that, that was, has been a key part of his job from day one is like, hey, we need help managing inventory. We need help managing the logistical, like operational side of the business where like product gets made and product gets shipped and things like that. So like in the early days when it was still smaller, I just did that by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I would go in and do the physical inventory counts and do that by myself. But really that was our, that was our first, that was our first like internal hire was was somebody to help with operations um mm -hmm. and he's got experience you know he's got experience working in bigger plants and medium-sized plants smaller plants um and it's still like we're still working on this like every like we talk about inventory every week because even though like even once you figure out a good way to like count inventory and and uh and account for um raw ingredients and raw packaging and then account for the builds and then account for the finished goods and all of that sort of stuff even once that's done it's kind of like it's you know like business what business 101 is kind of like cash flow management like managing like inventory ar cash like that whole you know beautiful beautiful triangle that like you can do you can be really successful and run out of money like you can be growing massively and run out of money because you have all your money in ar and inventory yep. so like that um that was a piece that we wanted to get in place and be working on and i know that it's like you look at yellowbird from the outside and it looks like oh it's beautiful marketing and it's fun packaging and it is but like getting the you know like getting the like s basics down getting the fundamentals of like we have to get paid for this stuff in a reasonable time we have to manage that inventory like that you know operationally like getting the operations part to work is, you know, in my mind, and I think pretty famously, one of the ways you have a business that sticks around, you know, like, and I'll say just there, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a big boom in like 
CPG in the last 10, 15 years, right? And especially like CPG food is a big thing. So it is, there are new companies getting started every year. And it's like, there's plenty of people that have a similar story to us. Like, uh, hey, we started it and it's a craft brand out of our kitchen, from our kitchen to, you know, from our family to yours or whatever. And they can raise some money on it. You know, they can raise some investor capital. And, you know, even if they're raising a couple million dollars, right, which is a lot of money for a startup brand, it's easy to spend it and then not have, you know, not be operationally sound. Like you can easily still go out of business. You can like, and anybody who's like a aspiring or like a, a early stage company, I want you to hear me say, you could go raise a, a five, $10 million today. And in two years, you could be out of business if you don't like, if you don't get the fundamentals down. So like we, we prioritize that early, 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 and we continue to um, prioritize that. And I know that, you know, you, y'all at Accountfully, y'all see that on all mm -hmm. of our calls, we're always trying to prioritize these fundamentals. So, yeah, no, I think, I think that's a great, uh, you know, kind of answer a couple of things in the operation side, clearly like the, the decision is similar to manufacturing, right? You can have an in-house employee focused solely on operations, or you can have all these kind of outsource uh, ops companies that can help support at an outsource level, right? It's really the decision you want for your business. And, and there's opportunities. And as George said, the CPG space keeps expanding and growing. There's so many different talent out there and folks that you can lean on and things. And, you know, I do think at the end of the day, you know, what we harp on our clients, inventory based clients is that is your biggest resource that is you need to have proper control, understanding, understanding, costing margins, etc. But at the end of the day, the cash can dry out when you buy too early, or it can dry out if you don't collect on your AR, right, or if you get hit on too many deductions that you shouldn't get hit on. So there's a lot of factors that come into play here. So what we do, George, when we end this our uh, kind of podcast here, uh, um, if you could go back to George in year two or year three of uh, Yellowbird, I just want two short answers here. What, what was the one do that you would you know recommend or say? And what is the one don't um, for a, a aspiring or a, a young kind of CPG startup? Oh, man. Um, I would say the, the do is do take risks. Like the whole, like you have to. Yep. I don't, I don't want any of like what I'm saying to be construed as like be super conservative. Cause if you do, I mean, like it is, you have to take risks to, to do anything, to do anything important. So do take risks. I would certainly like encourage the me from years ago to like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take risks because that's where, you know, in any, you know, like in any, uh, in any realm in any aspect of anything like the people and companies and organizations whatever that have done great things have taken risks so do take risks i would say um and then and then the thing that i would say don't do which is something uh here's something that i've had to learn the hard way like multiple times don't make the same mistake twice do take risks don't make the same mistake twice you can take a risk and it can be a mistake. Like, and if, if you learn from that, you don't make that mistake again, then it's a fair, it's generally is a fairly cheap education. Like quote unquote failure is, is a great education. Just don't make the same mistake twice. I love it. As a fellow entrepreneur, I, I always enjoyed the risk side of the, uh, the game, as, as you say, but calculated risk, learn, um, don't rinse and repeat, right? Um, learn from it and then move forward. So uh, I think very wise words, George. Um, so awesome. Well, this was great. Um, really enjoyed the conversation, George. Um, for anybody that's looking at Yellowbird um, to buy some sauce, yellowbirdsauce.com. You guys now have um, some hot dip. When did you launch that? Yeah, we do. We launched that. Um, we launched that in June of 2020, right at the beginning of a global pandemic um how's that going good yeah it's going pretty good the the only the only thing that i'm that we haven't figured out yet and i'm working on it is we haven't figured out how to do that d to c so right now it's just available in stores because it is a fresh you know perishable mm -hmm. item um which is a big leap for us but it's delicious so like um we've got if you go to our store locator on our website you can find like a store near you we've got it in all whole foods uh, it's a bunch of natural uh 
regional grocery stores across the country. And we are working on shipping it. So go try it. Awesome. Awesome. George does have a podcast on his website called the uh, Yellowbird Hotline, um, a very fun banter back and forth uh, uh, podcast versus the serious accounting finance operations thing here. Um, but hey, George, really appreciate your time. Um, thanks so much. And uh, we'll chat soon, man. And uh, last thing, just stay warm down yeah, there in uh, frigid, frigid, frozen Austin, which doesn't I know, right? once in a generation here. So all right, George, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.